and we're on all right so uh, here we go then so what we're looking at is basic oops basic electrochemistry so we're only going to go to some of the very basic ideas today so basic electrochemistry all right and what this means is basically cells we're going to look at cells now what is a cell what is a cell okay a cell is something that uses a potential difference between two half cells to oh it's not showing hold on um sorry thanks danish let's have a look what am i doing wrong here okay i must be doing something wrong you can't see anything. Right, let's do this. How about that? Can you see anything there? Can you see anything? Anything there? Excellent. Okay, so basic electrochemistry. First of all, what's a cell? It uses a potential difference between two half cells to create a current. All right. That's all it is. Now, if you have one side of a cell and another side of a cell, okay, there's one side of a cell and there's another, and we're going to put it, we're going to do a nice basic, very simple uh, cell diagram. Okay, now the way the convention is, we say this is the positive side and this is the negative side. And what moves around, well, electrons move from the negative side to the positive side. That's how cells work. Okay, they go from electrons move from the negative to the, to the positive. Okay, and we say there is some sort of potential difference across these um, these halves of the cell, these uh, terminals. All right. So, but if we actually looked at it, what would it look like? It would look like this: the positive side. This is what we call the positive side and the negative side. They both have electrons, and let me draw electrons in a different color. Okay, let's have nice uh, yellow electrons. All right, so these are electrons. They're on the positive side and on the negative side. It's just electrons. Okay, so both sides are actually just have electrons, have varying amounts of electrons associated with them, but the negative side has more electrons. So if the negative side has more electrons, there is a pressure because the electrons repel each other. These repel each other. Okay, and they force electrons to move this way across the wires and to the other side. In other words, all a cell is, is a, um, a side with a denser electron density. That doesn't sound good, does it? A higher electron density compared to a um, lower electron density. Okay, and that what pushes them along, what pushes them from one side to the other side, is just the repulsion. Okay, so when we say a negative and a positive side, it's all electrons. Okay, it just means that one side relative to the other is, let's have a look, this, this side is more negative than this side, and this is less negative. Okay, but instead of saying more and less, we just say, well, one side is the negative side. And the other side is the positive side. But it's a relative thing. It just happens to be more electrons on the negative side than the positive side. And therefore, electrons will flow from where there are more electrons to where there are less electrons. And the pressure is from repulsion, from electron-electron repulsion. Okay? So <clears throat> that's basically all a, all a cell is. It is a difference in electron densities. Okay? Does that make sense, Danish? Can I move on? Are you good with that? Since you're the only one here, I've got to ask you questions. All right. Are you good with that? You're good. I think you're good. Excellent stuff. Okay. So it's just a difference in electron densities. That's all it is. Okay. Now, let's get rid of this board. These are just basic ideas. That's all we're doing. All right. So let's do a very simple experiment. Let's have a piece of metal. Okay. And this piece of metal is zinc. And I'm going to put the piece of metal in a zinc solution here. Okay, there's a zinc solution. Doesn't matter what it is, zinc chloride, some sort of uh, soluble salt. 
And over the other side, I'm going to put a piece of metal into another solution. And this one is copper. I'm going to put this copper here, piece of copper, into a copper sulfate solution or copper ion solution. Now, believe it or not, there's going to be an equilibrium set up here at the surface. And there's going to be an equilibrium set up here at the surface between the ions in solution and the uh, ions in the uh, piece of metal. Because don't forget, in the piece of metal, it is zinc ions. If you remember this, this is what a piece of metal is, surrounded by electrons in this uh, delocalized field. Okay, so there is a there's an equilibrium between the metal and the solution, and there's an equilibrium on the right hand side between the metal and the solution. Okay, <clears throat> now this here is the is the uh, equilibrium. So we have zinc; it's in equilibrium with zinc ions. Okay, and two electrons are lost. All right, here we have copper in equilibrium with copper ions and two electrons are lost again. Now, I don't know which way it goes, but let's have a look. Every time a zinc ion goes from the piece of metal, let's pretend that zinc ion has gone from there to there, it leaves its electrons on the piece of metal. Okay, so the piece of metal becomes a little bit negative and the solution becomes a little bit positive. And therefore, we have a potential difference. We have a PD between the um, piece of metal and the solution. I can't measure this. This cannot be measured. Okay. We can't measure this. All right. We can't get at it. We can't get this difference in potential to do any work. Okay. We can't do that. And this thing is known as a half cell. Okay. Now in the copper. Same thing's going to happen. Maybe electrons are going to leave. Sorry, not electrons. Ions are going to leave. And there, the copper's going to leave and go into solution. And what's it going to do? Well, it's going to leave its electrons on there. Okay. And again, what's going to happen? Well, the piece of metal gets a little bit negative and the solution gets a little bit positive. And again, what do we have? We have a potential difference between these two. There's a PD built up. There's a potential, okay, in the system. We can't get at it, but there it is. All right. Now, <clears throat> this is the question. These are two half cells. So there's a half cell here. And we can't do anything with these things. They just, you know, there's a potential associated with the system. All right. So, you know, so far, so good. So what, really? Now, <clears throat> Which one of these two do you think there will be a greater potential on? Well, if we remember from Form 4, I guess, our... Uh, it's not the electronegativity series, is it? Let's start that again. It is the reactivity series. If we remember the reactivity series, we know that zinc is more reactive than copper. Okay? So in our minds, a nice way of thinking about it, is more zinc ions will go into solution. Okay, I'm doing three here, but on this side, I'm only doing two copper ions into solution. So we would imagine, even though we can't get at these systems, we'd imagine that if we could closely see this, for every ion that's gone into solution, there's going to be two electrons, but there's three ions that have gone into solution. So I'm going to draw six electrons here. And this side, I'm going to draw four electrons, okay? Why is this? Well, because zinc has a greater tendency to form the iron than copper. So more of them are going to go into the solution, okay? They're both going to go into the solution, but more zinc ions are going to go in because it's more reactive. Are we good, Danish? Are we good with that, that concept? Am I being too simple, do you reckon? Is this a bit too uh, easy for you? Don't forget, it's not this. Uh, this uh, video isn't necessarily for you; it's for everyone. So, do you think the class would appreciate this simplicity, or is it too simple? Maybe, maybe it's too simple. Danish, say something. It, yeah, okay, I think it's okay as well. Sorry to keep bugging you, but I, you know, we've got to do something, right? So we got two half cells there, and we can't do anything with it. But the beauty, beauty is, if we connect these now. Yeah, I think so too as well. If we connect these two with a voltmeter in the middle, okay, oh, there's docks outside now. All right, if we connect these two, well, because there's more electron density here 
electrons are going to flow from the more electron dense place okay to the less electron dense place yeah so they there will be a current for i don't know i'm going to guess now i'm going to say one millisecond okay it won't take long before these electrons balance each other out in other words electrons will go here and the electrons on the copper will eventually or very very quickly they'll uh, match the number of electrons or the density of electrons on the zinc and no more electrons will flow okay so that's not very good either we did get a current for a very short time but they will equalize okay and then the reaction will stop nothing will happen then so now we can do something clever well the reason the there was a current for a very short time is because the electrons kind of equalized each other but then they'll stop but if we do something clever and complete the circuit in other words if we have something here all right there okay and in this in its simplest form this is a piece of filter paper okay and the filter paper normally we soak it in um this guy potassium nitrate solution okay so if we do that what happens is as the electrons flow through here up the top circuit here this side becomes more negative this side down here uh, the copper side becomes more negative and what happens in the salt bridge is to counteract that positive ions come off the salt bridge and in this case it's going to be k plus ions they're going to come off the salt bridge and the other side it keeps pushing electrons around and so it's becoming more positive because it's losing electrons what happens here is to replace all these electrons lost to replace the charge of the electrons ne uh, nitrate ions come off the salt bridge here okay so it's hard to imagine but what's happening now is we're allowing the electrons to flow through the top circuit this top circuit is known as the external circuit and the bottom circuit is known as the internal circuit how do you spell internal internal circuit okay and now we can have a flow that will carry on won't they contaminate the half cell well that's the thing you see um uh, it shouldn't have ions associated with ions in here or ions in here okay the reason we use um this thing as you obviously know this thing is known as a salt bridge okay now it can't be made of metal because that would contaminate things that would create its own potentials so what we do is the salts come out of the piece of filter paper just to equalize the charge so one side doesn't get more negative than the other side okay it's uh, it's to complete the circuit all right so will it contaminate it yeah you will get nitrate ions in one side and potassium ions in the other but compared to the original concentrations it won't make any difference at all so when i connect these two i will get a voltage electrons like this when i've connected it like this i'll get a voltage electrons will go from the zinc side to the copper side and i think i can't remember exactly the voltage on this but i think it's 1.1 volt i get there okay now i don't know what's going on here all right all i know is the difference between the electrode potential of one half cell and the electrode potential of the half half cell of the other half cell is 1.1 volts yeah now i'm sure you're all very good at physics and don't forget i'm just not talking to Danish now i'm talking to all of you um the way we get a voltage uh, a voltmeter this is a simple voltmeter voltmeters have sides Okay, and they only work if you connect them up properly all right and now this voltmeter will only show a reading of 1.1 volts when the negative side is connected up to the zinc side whoops and the positive side is connected up to the copper side now what that means it means the electrons are coming from the zinc yeah to the copper so the zinc is more negative with respect to the copper and we get an electron flow and we get 1.1 volts if i turn this voltmeter the other way around the voltmeter just wouldn't work it can only go one way all right through a voltmeter okay but if i do it properly i i get get this i get 1.1 volts and which side is the negative terminal well it's the zinc that's the one that's creating that's the one that's uh, giving us its electrons how do we know it's the negative terminal well because i had to set up my voltmeter in such a way that it would only work when the negative was connected to the zinc side does that make sense am i that is simple isn't it i think yeah does that make sense 
Unfortunately, I've only got you to talk to now, but thanks, uh, Danish. Nil, but Danish, I meant to say. All right, so there you go. So we've got this set up here. Oh, it's beautiful. We don't know how, you know, we don't know much about the zinc cell and the um, and the copper cell. But if we add them together, we get this lovely 1.1 volt. Okay. Now, um, we can, look, we will never know. We can't measure the half cell of the zinc zinc iron solution. And we can't measure, cannot measure, can't measure the copper system either. We can't measure these. But what we can do is we can um, we can rate them against the standard. Okay, so let's put a standard in. Now the standard we use, obviously you all know this, is something called the standard. Okay, just for standard. Standard hydrogen electrode. Okay, often known as the SHE. Okay, now this thing is this. Let me try and draw this. You should all be able to draw these, by the way. A very simple one like I'm drawing. Okay, this is going to contain our hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas is going to splurge in here. Okay, H2 gas. Now, there's got to be conditions because hydrogen is a gas. It's a real pain to deal with. It's got to be at one atmosphere and it's got to be at room temperature. All right, so they're the conditions of the hydrogen, and the hydrogen just squishes in here. It, the whole thing is in a beaker. Let's do a different color for the beaker. Let's do blue. We haven't used blue for a while. So let's use a nice blue beaker. Okay, there it is. There's a lovely beaker. And this is going to be the level of water, isn't it? And there's going to be bubbles bubbling out here. We're just pa passing hydrogen into it. Now, this is the clever bits and pieces we're going to do now. We have a piece of metal going down here. And here we have a piece of platinum. Okay, that dips in the uh, the water here or the solution here. And it gets bubbles on it. Okay, bubbles, little bubbles form all on the platinum. Now, this bit of platinum here, let's see what color we got. We can't use black, so... Let's use what color? A nice purple color, I guess. Okay, this thing here is platinum. Okay, now this is a bit technical, but it has very, very small particles of platinum. So, so small that they absorb. They, You know, if you polish a nice piece of platinum, it looks shiny. But if you have tiny, tiny particles of platinum, it actually um, refracts light in all sorts of directions. So many so that if you look at it, none come into your eyes. So it looks black. So this is called platinum black. Because it's so, the, the surface area is so tight, you know, um, so great. The particle sizes, the bits of platinum are so small, it looks black from the outside. So we call it platinum black. Now, we, why do we use platinum black? Because it has a rough surface. Okay. Why do we want a rough surface? Well, if you, there's the surface of the platinum, we want bubbles on it. We want bubbles to form on it. Now, an analogy is here is if you have a can of Coke or a glass of Coke, I should say, and you put a straw in it, there's your Coke. Okay, these are the ice cubes. You see the bubbles on the straw. And that's the analogy here. That's what we want. Okay. All right. Anyway, so we've got bubbles on this piece of platinum, hydrogen bubbles. And then we're going to connect it up to a voltmeter again. And now we're going to connect it to our test cell or our test half cell. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, there you go. Test half cell there. Okay, there. All righty. And let's pretend the first test half cell I'm going to use, I'm going to use zinc. And I'm going to use zinc ions here. Aqueous. I'm going to set up a salt bridge. Salt bridge chemistry is complicated, by the way. Um, I believe not when I was younger, I used to understand a lot of this stuff, but it's all gone, guys, I'm afraid. Anyway, the salt bridge um, equalizes the charge between the two, okay? It, a very simple way of saying it would be, oh, it completes the circuit. All right. But a nicer way of saying it is it equalizes the charge, all right? It allows charge to flow. Isn't platinum easy? It is used because it's inert, yeah. All right. We could use other inert things, but... Um, uh, yeah, we use platinum, but platinum black has a nice rough surface. Okay, so we could use other inert electrodes as well. But for the standard conditions, we use platinum.
All right, and it is in there. Yeah, it is. I'm yeah. trying to think what else they use. That I think they could use titanium as well. Um, the thing is, it can't react with the um, can't react with the ions there, can it? Right. What's this solution? And this is an important thing. This is a solution of H plus ions, and the solution must be concentration one mole per decimeter cubed. Okay, so it's an acid, isn't it? We often use HCl. If we use HCl, it's got to be one molar. We don't use nitric acid because nitric acid is a pain. Nitric acid decomposes really easily, so we kind of lay off nitric acid. So if we're going to use sulfuric acid, because it's a dibasic acid, we've got to use 0.5 molar. Does, I hope that makes sense. These silly little things are important eh, that you've got to remember. So on the left-hand side, you know, it's called a standard hydrogen electron. And on the right, we, we're testing the zinc cell, aren't we? So we want to say, well, compared to hydrogen, how about zinc? Is zinc positive or negative? Well, what we find is we only get a reading on our voltmeter when we put the negative on this side and the positive on this side. Okay, it only works then. Okay, so what that means is the zinc must be the negative electrode. Okay, now when we connect these two guys together, um, because zinc is the negative electrode, it means the electrons must flow from the zinc like this. It goes down here and down here. Okay, by the way, let me set up my equation here. It's hydrogen. Oh, Solofello's sort of arrived. Well done, Solofello. Sort of all right, you're on video. Right, so we've got H2 gas. Oh, don't laugh, dear. Bloody hell, turn your microphone off. Bloody hell, Danish. It was fine without her, wasn't it? Right, it goes to 2H plus aqueous plus two electrons. And this one is zinc, um, zinc solid. It goes to Zn2 plus plus two electrons. So these are the two equilibria, the one at the zinc and the one at the... Um, hydrogen all right so electrons go from the zinc to the hydrogen all right and as we said how do we know that well because we set up this is how we set up the voltmeter this is our voltmeter and we had to set it up like that all right now when we do this and now i'm going to guess now i think we get 0 0.76 volts and i'm guessing that it's about that i think okay 0 0.76 now we're doing it against hydrogen so this is what we say well the zinc zinc system has an electrode potential a standard electrode potential of well the the volume sorry not the volume the um the amount is 0 0.76 okay now it's 0 0.76 and now but with respect to hydrogen is it positive or negative well we've seen with respect to hydrogen it's negative so we say it's 0 0.76 minus okay so that's what we that's what we call the electrode potential of the zinc zinc cell okay the zinc half cell why is it negative well compared to hydrogen it pushes its electrons onto hydrogen okay how much does it push it pushes with a kind of force of 0.76 so the, there's two bits to an electrode potential there's this bit this is the kind of the vector bit if you like it tells you the direction with respect to hydrogen and this bit is the scalar part it's how big a push it has. Sort of fellow and Danish, does that make sense? You're the only two I've got to talk to. So I'm I'm sorry. No, nah, don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> oh, you don't understand. Oh, sort of fellow. Danish, would you like to type in, while I have a drink of water, the reason for the salt bridge? Why do we do a salt bridge? I'll give you like 30 seconds. I'm just having a drink of water. Off you go, Danish. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Coquetzel's here. All right, Coquetzel. Why is everyone coming late? <laughs> I don't mind. It's nice to see you. But we've been going for half an hour, guys. Right, yeah, it completes the circuits, all the fellow. There is, it's a bit more technical oh, from shopping. Oh, you should have told me you were going shopping. All right, I would have done it later. All right, sorry about that. I didn't know. I promised I didn't know. So we good then. So yeah, it, it completes the circuit. If it didn't complete the circuit, solar fellow, the it, it the, you would get no um you would get no current. Yeah, you will get when we say a temporary current, Danish, we like mean a millisecond. It would equalize. 
the electron densities would equalize, but after that it would stop. So we need something to let it go round. It's like, what's a good analogy? Okay, a good analogy is if I got a hose, if I connected a hose to water, okay, and a tap, yeah, and I pushed it into a, a closed container, okay, now I could push the water into the closed container for a while, but after a while, the pressure inside the closed container would equal the pressure of the water going into the container, and no more water would flow into the container. Does that make sense, that analogy? So if I had a closed container with water rushing into it, yeah, the water would, believe it or not, would eventually stop when the pressure inside the container equaled the pressure of the water going into the container. Does that make sense, Ola fellow? Does it make sense? So I've got water going into a container, but after a while, the pressure inside the container is equal to the pressure of the water going in. So what happens? No more water goes in. Okay, so how do I get water continually going into the container? What shall I do the, to the container? Anyone, anyone, anyone can answer this. How do I get water continually going into the container? Anyone, anyone, anyone at all, make a hole, exactly, all right, and what does making a hole do, it equalizes the pressure, so more can go in, yeah, so, it, without the salt bridge, okay, um, instead of water pressure, what's the pressure stopping more electrons from continually going in? to um to the hydrogen in this case what pressure would stop it it's not water pressure what pressure is it anyone uh, it's hard making analogies with physical systems because uh, this is a chemical system isn't it so you'd make a hole to let the water go in but in this case without a salt bridge the thing that supplies the pressure is electron density it's electron pressure Okay, how do you relieve the electron pressure? Have the salt bridge. Yeah, does that kind of make sense to everyone? Are we all right with that? Is that okay? Are we good? Are we good? No one's answering. Everyone's gone. Everyone's gone shopping. All right, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, sort of, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We'll just have to go on, though, won't we? All right. So which way do the electrons go here? Now, before I, before I um, finish off this, I've realized we've been going for about half an hour. The whole idea of these videos, I don't want them to be long, because if they're long, everyone gets bored, don't they? So I'm going to stop it in about five minutes. All right. Because I don't want to do too much today. We've done actually quite a lot. Those, you know, I, Obviously, you didn't go from the start, but you'll see we've actually talked about quite a lot of nice issues. Okay. All right. So which way do the electrons go? They go from the zinc to, um, to the hydrogen, don't they? So let me get my rubber here and get rid of all this rubbish here down the bottom. Okay. So <clears throat> if it goes from the zinc to the hydrogen, what are the, this is, these are the equi equilibria. So here we have the equilibria. Okay. But then we connect the two together. So this is before connection. This is before connection, this one. And then after connection, after we've connected them, well, what reaction happens here? Zinc is pushing electrons. These are being forced onto it. So the reaction at the left-hand electrode is this. Hydrogen ions, if this my pen's going to work, are going to suck up these electrons, and it's going to form no more equilibrium sign, can you see? It's going to form hydrogen gas. And this side on the left, zinc must produce electrons for me because it's pushing electrons over. So it's producing electrons. So electrons, zinc ions are going in here all over the place. There they go. And electrons keep pumping over. So before electrons, we have these two equilibria here. But after connection, we have two very specific chemical equations. Now, this, this is one. And this is the other one. And interestingly, I think this is kind of interesting. If we add these two equations together, okay, add this one. Let's call this equation number one. 
And this equation number two. If we add them together, we get this. Zn solid plus 2H plus aqueous gives Zn2 plus aqueous plus H2 gas. Because the electrons, as you can see, will cancel out. Now, if you see the overall equation. This one at the bottom. This equation... Well, it's what happens when you put zinc in acid. Of course it reacts. And what does it give us? It gives us zinc ions and hydrogen. Yeah? So listen to this. This is kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. How could I react zinc here with acid? I could get a beaker, and I could have a beaker, and I could have an acid in the bottom. It doesn't matter which acid, sulfuric acid. And I could chuck some zinc in. And what would I get? I would get this reaction. Okay? But what I've done very cleverly, I've separated the hydrogen from the zinc side and I forced the electrons to go over this thing and give me their energy. If I just throw a piece of zinc into HCl, everything gets hot. The exothermicity of the reaction goes into making the water hot. But if I'm clever and I separate the two reagents out like this and get them to react via a piece of wire, I can use that exothermicity to drive electrical circuits. Isn't that crazy? We're just using the exothermic part of the reaction. Instead of making the water hot, we're making electrons move through a device, whatever device we want, a cell phone or whatever. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that the coolest thing? I honestly think that's really good. But do we get that? Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? It's cool, isn't it? It's really interesting, I think. All right, it's a topic close to my heart. I like electrochem. Right, guys, let me stop the uh, video. There we are.